Hey folks, thanks for tuning in on my interpretation of Lady Godiva. What we're looking at here is the Alchemy Abstracts. Alchemy is a free program and it simplifies things greatly so that you can approach things from a very uh, clean and non-detailed slate. Draw dumb, I actually like to say, and what I mean by that is turn off the part of your brain in the beginning that thinks about details and obsesses about details. Alchemy is like drawing with a fat Sharpie. You really can only be so accurate with it, unless you want to be, and that allows you to come at things from a shape perspective. Having selected the abstract that I like the best, it's time to start refining. This first stage is just out of my head doodling really fast, then I ghost it out, and I start looking at reference, and I start drawing with reference based on what was out of my head beneath which keeps some of the freshness that is in the drawing as much as I can. When I start working with line work and hatch work, I think of it as line over form and not just line for the sake of lines. I want it to actually build volume into what I'm doing. But at the same time, it's almost like music. It's almost like there's a rhythm to it that's like da 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 And there are quiet areas and there are much more busier areas where the rhythm would be sped up. After we kind of get those movements down, it's time to start thinking about my values a little bit more. I had these in my head even back in the early uh, Alchemy Abstract, so I just established that a little bit greater and started thinking about the border that goes around this piece. However, before we can talk about the border, I sent this to my critique group who are amazing. And the first thing they did, of course, was beat the crap out of me about the horse in the last value version that you saw. I had a lot of dog anatomy in there. And I had done something where I tucked her foot, her bottom foot, behind the thigh of the horse. And they're like, dude, that's just not going to work. And I looked at a lot more horse stuff. And I talked to my lovely wife, who's an artist who rides horses. And she's like, it's not going to work. So uh, I had to go and redo it and get her second foot in there. So, you know, drawing is all about redrawing and nothing is done until literally you are handing it off to where it needs to go. Everything is fair game to be changed and changed again. So Godiva actually rode through the town naked because her husband was taxing the people a huge amount of money and sending it off to the king. And she said, stop taxing them. And he said, sure, she rides through town naked. And she did. But the townspeople loved Godiva so much that they actually agreed not to look at her as she strolled through town naked. And only one guy did look, but that's another story. So to me, the horse represents uh, the townspeople and the dollar represents, well, the taxation on the townspeople for the king. After thinking about it and talking it over with my peer group, I thought maybe that using the dollar bill so directly was too obvious, and it might be more subtle if I just used the border from the dollar, which would be really cool because people would recognize it, but then I not, might not instantly know why they recognized it. So I simplified it to what you see here. All right, enough chatter. Let's get this thing on copper. So the first step was to take my copper. I just lightly clean it. You actually don't have to do a whole lot to copper. Uh, I got the oil off of it because I coated it with white FW ink first. And then I did what's called a, an old school laser transfer, which is essentially I got a Xerox of my image in reverse and I laid it face down on top of my FW ink coated copper. And then I used lacquer thinner with a paper towel rubbed the back of it with a lacquer thinner and then used a spoon or any kind of like smooth object and I rubbed the laser toner off of the piece of paper and down onto the copper. It's a great way to sort of uh, get a drawing that you've worked hard on uh, down onto whatever surface you're working on being wood or canvas or a uh, panel or whatever. It's just a nice way to transfer something and just get to work. Do this in a well-ventilated area. I'm wearing a mask as I'm using the lacquer thinner and it is out in my garage as you can see there which makes it uh, much better for breathing. Now the next thing I did is I took the same drawing that you see here transferred and I coated it once again with another layer of white FW ink to <laughs> ghost it out which is what I did back in the digital version so that we can start working it up. Jumping ahead using three colors of FW ink, I start inking the figure for the umpteenth time now. Basically, I'm using those three values basically to get darker and darker in the nooks and crannies um, to pop the figure out and to round it out. 
I'm looking at the underdrawing I had before. It's not line for line. It's pretty close though because I did a lot of the volume building that I wanted to do. Uh, but I gotta approach it new. I leave my mind open to take lines different directions if it suits the piece more. I wish I actually had recorded uh, the horse inking, but I did that as a live stream. So I don't actually have tape of that, which is why we're jumping on the figure. But you can see the ghosted out transfer drawing, which is that light gray on the leg there. And I'm just going over it with FW ink and pulling my pin directionally so that stuff starts pulling back and forth into space. Rounding out the forms. My impatience got the best of me, and after laying a middle value over the border, I couldn't help myself. I grabbed my templates and my sharp pointy carbide scribe, and I started engraving the dollar elements. I just, I guess I just wanted that bling factor uh, very soon, which is funny because I wound up painting over some of this uh, engraving later, which turns out fine, but uh, sometimes you just got to chase the muse wherever you can, my friends. And now it is time to establish the middle values on the horse. Uh, because all the pin work is already there, I get to be, you know, really aggressive with my mark making. But even notice I am dragging the brush directionally once again to build out those forms. Um, the strokes aren't just, it's not just like I'm like, I'm going to fill this in. I'm actually thinking about the direction. I'm sponging things out to add texture. I'm just having a good time with it at this stage. Making a mess, people. And making a mess continues. I pretty much slathered this piece with any mid of middle value that I was going to need so that I could do what I'm doing here, which is to start inking the highlights with hatchwork. This is really no different than a tonal grayscale sketchbook that many of you have worked in before. I'm just doing it with value and color as opposed to just using a white chalk pencil and I'm doing it on controlled underpinnings um, of value and line. Building out those forms. I, I, say, I keep saying that, but that's really what it is. I mean, you, you can see it. Now that's interesting. You see how suddenly I'm using blue and that's again to round the form back. There's a cool light coming from the backside of her and using the blue there is just going to add so much depth to her figure uh, as opposed to using that same warm uh, everywhere. Um, but, you know, it's basically establish a middle value, go a step darker and a step lighter and see where you're at and see what other value just adjustments you need to make. We start working on the tail, getting it to pop out against the figure, um, tightening it up a little bit as we go. Here we start working on the horse. We mix up some custom horse highlight color. I've probably got three different little Dixie cups of fluid that I'm using here. And going about it, the same thing we did with the dark line, we are now doing with the light line. But the nice thing is, as you're using the dip pin, sometimes it'll get thinner, It'll the paint will fade a little bit as it dries, and you can really build it up and build it up. The truth is, is that FW ink, FW acrylic ink loves to stick to FW acrylic ink. Uh, the first time I used a, a dip pin, a metal nib pin on copper, I thought for sure it was going to scratch the paint off. Nope. FW ink is tough stuff, my friends. It will hold up to it and you can build on top of it and build on top of it and build on top of it, which is exactly what I'm doing here. Now, again, I'm going in and finding those dark spots. Think of it like Thomas's English muffins, the buttery nooks and crannies. Like that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those sweet little tink, tink, tink accent marks, like tick, tick, ah, tick, tick, ah, where I can find those spots to just hammer it and um, give it accents. Yeah, like a drum kit, I guess is a good way to think about it. So that's where we're at with this stage. And look, I'm still going. Now we're working on the tail. I'm using a brush now. Because I'm filling in, I'm, I'm filling in a darker value uh, that I can work in and out of if I want to. Um, and now I'm going back to my dip pin so I can get a little bit more accurate with my lines. I use some cool gray on the tail so it's not the same warm paint that was on, say, the front of the horse. Again, to push things back. And 
you can see above that I have my value study printed out so that I can look at it and see if I'm on track. But honestly, I'm working so fast and feverishly, I'm really barely looking at it unless there's an area that got so obscured that I can no longer see it. And if that's the case, sometimes I'll, uh, I'll get in there a little bit deeper. So not a lot going on in this clip other than I'm go ahead and I'm laying in the middle value of her hair so that I can set it up to engrave on top of it. And what I mean by middle value, I don't necessarily mean I've gone to a 50% value. That's not the case. This is much lighter than a 50% value. I just mean that if I'm going to go, I just, if I'm going to, if when I say a middle value, it can be dark as long as I can go a step darker and a step lighter. That's somewhere in the middle. When you don't have the right tool, sometimes you got to make it. Little sticky tape and some wet dry sandpaper onto a dentist tool and suddenly I've got myself a sweet little device that I can now use to sand back through the copper. I've been so wanting to do this part of it this whole time, but I did have enough patience to wait. But here we go. So it's like a little spatula and I'm exactly doing what I just said. I'm sanding through the copper or using steel wool to get back down to the copper in certain accented areas of the piece. I don't want to expose all the copper again in the negative space. I want to leave some of that paint towards the top. I'm also using a sculpting tool, uh, which I think is called a smoother. I could have that one wrong. Uh, it's just a piece of metal, which is awesome because it's got so many curves on it and I can use it to uh, as a mask, essentially. This is a razor blade, just an X-Acto knife. And now I'm starting to pull linear carving into it. The X-Acto knife isn't as extreme as, say, a carbide scribe or a traditional graver, so it's a little bit more subtle, and I don't want to say a little bit more sketchy-like, but kind of. It's just not as aggressive. So I can do this sort of form wavy stuff through the paint or into the copper that's already been sanded, and uh, I don't know, it's almost like a foggy sort of effect. A little detail of it, really digging in as my camera work goes off camera, of course. And this is all just on a whim. There's no plan here. I just, I didn't even know I was going to do these lines until I started doing them. And then I said, that looks cool. Let's do it more places. So I'm open for experimentation. As much as you guys see me plan and you see me plan a lot, that freedom is a foundation that I can actually take leave of and have fun in other places areas of the painting. I don't know exactly how I'm going to achieve everything that's in my initial layouts, um, but you know, that's part of the fun. But thankfully, a lot of the big questions are answered, like the foot is drawn, I know how that hand's going to be drawn. It frees my mind to think about the application of materials uh, a little bit more intuitively. Now we're engraving the hair. We already went back around and we engraved the border. Uh, and the hair is, I think, the last thing we need to engrave on Godiva. And I actually will switch tools here in a second and I'll go. The paint was pretty thick here and you'd think it just flake off, but FW ink sticks. I actually have to use nail polish remover if I want to get FW ink off this thing. That is a traditional graver, what real engravers use and you can get deeper with that. It is much harder control though and it can slip away from you uh, if you're not careful. But I wanted light to reflect a little bit heavier in those areas that I'm using the graver. But we're back to the carbide scribe because it is like basically drawing with a sharp point. So it's something I'm much more used to. Um, so I'm comfortable with it. You can see already light reflecting on the copper there. It's neat. Like the light overhead is sort of a warm light. That's why the copper's orange down at the bottom of the piece here. And the light on either side of me are ot lights. I've got one to my right and one to my left. So it's a dual lighting setup. And I'm having to move my head so much because I'm having to catch the reflections. And depending on where you put your head around this piece, it changes. So <laughs> you got to move to know what you're doing. Now, we're establishing the nooks and crannies, Thomas's English muffin, buttery nooks and crannies of the border and just going a step darker. Because I glazed over this a second time, some of that initial engraving you guys saw is actually darker. I don't mind it though. I reestablished sort of the outer border of the leaves and the different elements. And it's kind of cool to me that there's, there's like almost two values of engraving on this thing now. Um, 
Yeah, because I like changing it up. I don't want everything to be the same, same everywhere. I try to have a little bit more fun with it. I get a nice little shot of the hair there. Again, it changes. Every time I move this piece, you're going to see that the hair looks different from every angle, which is the intent of these. The intent of these paintings is to make something that you really can only experience in person. Uh, you're never going to get it any other way, even as a print. Um, I can get some cool reflection in a print, but you walk by it and it's obviously going to be static value-wise. Okay, oil painting stage. This is me using gamblin fast matte oil paint and i just mixed up a dirty green and i started looking at the abstract nooks and crannies i already had there and accenting it because i needed to pop out her head and her shoulder a little bit more using a q-tip swab there for a second to smooth it and move, now moving that glaze this oil painting glaze over other parts of the figure again pushing those values around this is my final highlighting so i've got some white oil paint on here and I'm going in and just punching those final little highlights with oil paint. Slightly buttery and uh, now I'm spattering turp into my oil paint to create that texture you saw. We get a little signature and that's it my friends. We have gotten to the end of the Lady Godiva painting and that's me just moving it around so you guys can check it out. Varnish time! Woohoo! This is not instantly right after. It had a nice solid data dry. I'm using Gamvar. Gamvar is actually designed to go on paintings that are dry to the touch. You don't have to wait for six months to use Gamvar. You can just use it and I love it. So now the piece is hermetically sealed. The copper will not change uh, as oxygen is not going to be getting to it and it's pretty darn stable. I have one for two years that I've been looking at and it hasn't changed at all. So. Thanks for following along, guys.